what a treat to be back here at Meadowview. It seems like about once every six months, for one reason or another, we make it here. Um, and it's, it's just always a treat. We were here for the bounce house thing back, I think, in the fall and for Pablo's uh, installation. And um, it's, it's just always a treat to be, to be with you. And one of the great benefits of working with Ministry of the State is uh, being able to connect with churches all throughout North Carolina. And, and uh, you uh, so faithfully encourage us, pray for us, support us, and, and we're really thankful. In fact, uh, about a week ago, I was able to um, sit down with Senator Steve Jarvis, who is the senator, state senator for Davidson County, and we sat down for about a half hour together and just had a great conversation, had the chance to pray for him, and um, hear about his heart for the Lord, his heart for North Carolina and Davidson County and uh, ways in which uh, he's seeking to serve and, and to, to just pray for him. So I want to encourage you to, to pray for your elected officials. The scripture commands us to do so, and um, you know they, they need our prayers, and they need the wisdom to govern well and to uh, govern for the sake of God's glory. Uh, those that are there to, to do his bidding. And then there are those obviously there who are not and um, who obviously don't love Jesus. And uh, I would ask that you pray for uh, God to open up doors and avenues for me to speak the gospel to them and befriend them and impart the truth and grace of the gospel to them. As you talk with uh, the, the politicians in, in Raleigh, you, you sense um, that this past year has produced a good bit of angst and anxiety. Do you feel a little bit of that in your own life too? By the way, I mean it, it's uh, it's been quite a it's been quite a year, right? It's uh, you know you look back. Where, where are we? End of um, we're in the end of May now of 2021. Well, in end of May 2020, we were we still didn't know how long this whole thing was going to go, and then we had a presidential election that was that was heating up and there was just a lot of sausage making going on with all of that and uh, it just all of the pressures and weights of of life in the midst of a pandemic in the midst of a political situation that was heavy in the midst of a cultural uh, situation that seemed to be deviating into every every which direction that is at odds with the things of of Christ and and uh, these things don't just happen out in the world, right? They're not just kind of out there somewhere. They're happening in your lives. And then you come into the church, and they're part and parcel of the church. And so even in churches, there's been uh, some friction, some disunity, some, some uh, trials and tribulations that uh, have, have come upon churches as individuals within those churches have, have sought to navigate these things. And so it's no wonder that the, the political and social and epidemiological issues ha have, have sort of maybe caused some friction even between uh, members of the, the body of Christ. But one of the things that um, has, I, I think, stirred up a lot of anxiety in the hearts of ministers and the hearts of uh, members of the church people who are seeking to, to walk with the Lord, is, um, is just what's going on culturally right now. What, what is bearing down on us that is seeking to, uh, to gravitate our, our and, and serve as, as sort of the objects of our functional trust, of where we're placing our identity. Because identity is, the, is almost like the fundamental theme of the culture at the moment. What is my identity? How do I define myself? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Why does it matter? These are the, these are the questions that, that people are facing. They're answering them uh, by, by oftentimes looking within how they feel and, and then going in that direction rather than, than banking themselves on the objective truth of who God is and who he reveals himself to be in his word. And the, th the, the thing that has... has um, concerned me, and I think concerned a lot of, uh, of others within the church, a lot of ministers I know, is, is the lack of discernment that uh, many folks in the church have displayed regarding these things. Because we're, we're living in an age where, in the name of exclusion, we exclude. And in the name of tolerance, we cancel. 
and in the name of peace, there's violence. And in the name of anti-racism, there's actual racial bigotry. And too often in the church, we've been passive in our response to this, and, and we've actually laid some measure of foundation to allow these sort of deviations to creep into our lives and, and shape us in ways that are at odds with the things of the Lord. Um, th- there are frameworks that are, that are creeping in on, in those uh, respects, and even uh, in, in some good churches, gospel-preaching churches, reformed churches, Bible-believing churches, um, there's a measure in which we've capitulated to the spirit of the age. So when I speak of these things, I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in fighting a culture war. I want you to understand that. The, the culture war of the 80s and 90s and so forth, that, that, that ship has sailed. And that culture war has been lost. The the institutions, all the institutions in our country right now are are shaped by by people with frameworks and worldviews that are in conflict with the scriptures. And the, the goal of the church, the mission of the church, is not to go back and just moralize the culture because you can get the culture all on board with good and right things, but if they don't love Jesus, they're just as lost. We're not legalists. We're not Pharisees. We're seeking to bring the gospel to bear on people. And even if we look back into the good old days, you know, as the great theologian Billy Joel once said, the good old days weren't always good, and tomorrow ain't as bad as it seems. Right? And, and I mean, it, it wasn't like those were always the best days anyway. So, the, the point is this, is that, w- is that we are in a, a, a battle, a war, so to speak, where her, the, the church and her members and her ministers are, are faced with the tension of engaging the culture r- without accommodating to it. And sometimes we have accommodated to it and at other times, we've just sucked the culture right out of the straw. So what we want to be concerned with more than just the, the moral uprightness of the culture is ultimately the health of the church, the health of our families, the health of our own souls, and our faithfulness there as we seek to pursue Christ and enjoy Christ and glorify Him and enjoy Him in our families, in our collective lives together in this body, as we go out into the world, which is increasingly antagonistic to the things of Christ. So the question that we have to reckon with as boys and men going into this world is this, how are we as Christian men seeking to live for the glory of God in a culture that is at odds with him, in light of the cataclysmic changes that have taken place in our world so quickly. It's a personal question to me because I, I have a 14-year-old daughter who's about to start high school next year. And some of you have children in that age. Some of you are actually in that stage. You're, you're in middle school, you're in high school, and it, it's, it's not the same for her as it was for me. And, and I, grew up, I grew up in the land of fruits and nuts in California, which is probably about ready to make you want me to run off right now, but that's where I grew up. I, I, and and there's, there's the, the literal, there's, there's California that's the figurative fruits and nuts, and the part of California that's where the literal fruits and nuts come from, and I come from where the literal fruits and nuts come from. So that ought to help you kind of understand. I, I grew up in Fresno, Central California, a little bit more moderate place, but by California standards. And, and uh, it, was still, it was still California. And, and um, you know, the, 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 world that I, the world that I grew up in was, was just very different than the world that she's growing up in. 30 years later, in the same place. The social attitudes surrounding sexuality, 
sexual orientation, marriage, race, ethnicity, have changed dramatically over the past 20 years or so. Uh, in 2019, the Center for Disease Control, which you know some of you will take that for what it is, but the Center for Disease Control um, indicated that nearly 22% of high school girls are identifying as LGBTQ. 22%. 14% as bisexual. And not only has that identity moved from being radical, which is where it was when I was in high school in the 1990s, to, to being actually acceptable to where it was when I was in college, to being popular where it is now, but now it's policy, and not just political policy, but policy for our whole lives, that if, if, you, don't, if you don't actually support it, but not just support it, but, but promote it and celebrate it, then, then, you'll, then you'll be pushed to the margins, shoved to the edges. You'll be, you'll be ridiculed. You'll lose friends. You'll lose relationships. And it doesn't matter how much you love everyone as we're called to do as followers of Christ and serve them, and befriend them, and, and live in relationship with them. That doesn't matter. You, you, have, to, you have to be full-fledged in support. It's not about tolerance anymore. Tolerance was 20 years ago. It's, it's celebration now. It's pride. There can't be any ambiguity in your position on this. And, and we, we see that, and we see the, a lot of what's happening with with ethnicity and race taking the same kind of tone. Everything, everything is about racism now. Everything is. Everything is racist. Everything is about supremacy and fragility. And you're no longer approached as an individual. You're approached as a group, and you're lumped in with a group. And that's, that's where we're at. Last summer, we saw protesters with signs that would say, silence is violence. And this is the dogma of anti-racism. Again, it's, if you're not, it's, it's not good enough to, to, to just love your neighbor red and yellow, black and white, to engage them as an equal, to engage them as someone who's created in the image of God, to love them as such. That's not enough. No, you, you have, to, you have to, to speak out. You have to speak out on your social medias. You have to march in the protest. You have, you have to, to go all in on these things because the first commandment of that worldview is thou shalt commit to actively dismantle all systems and institutions that produce racism, homophobia, and so forth. And if you do not actively, proactively participate in these things, you are complicit in those sins. And there are ways even which those of us who have a high view of Christ and the Scripture have even been deceived. Those on the political left and even the political right have often fallen prey to looking to political ends, to those holding political offices, to who governs us or to what laws are passed as the way in which the kingdom of God moves forward. We wouldn't say that, but that's ultimately somewhat in our heart in which we believe. We've, we've so fused our identity in Christ with our identity as an, as an American or as a Republican or as a Democrat that there's no meaningful friction between our politics and our theology. And, and for some of us, the hopes of for the country, the flourishing of Christianity in it have, have stood or fell on the basis of who's in office and what they do and who's appointed to this and who gets defeated there. And we fall and pray to these things. And it presents a major challenge, I think, to the Christian. I think it presents a major challenge to the church because all of society right now has, has boiled down to oppressed versus oppressors. It's based on 
race, religion, politics, sex, sexual orientation, class, all these things. And, and Christianity, the, the kind of Christianity that you find in Scripture alone is viewed as a negative cultural force. It's viewed as a negative cultural force. It's, view, it's viewed as, as, as bigoted. Things like propositional truth on the basis of, of Scripture is not even relevant to people. It, what's relevant is lived experiences. That's where the truth lies. What's how I feel is how I'm defined. And, and, and that's what leads me to inward satisfaction. And if that's the case, then, then what we find in Scripture becomes something that, that is merely subjective. And if it's at odds with how I feel, then it's oppressive. And that's why Christianity isn't so often viewed as this negative force. And I hope you see how that creates a great challenge for us as believers, doesn't it? It's a challenge for us in, in, in our age because simply by affirming what Scripture affirms and denying what Scripture denies, we become part of the oppressing group. And this is why Christianity is seen as being bigoted, being backward, being hostile to the flourishing of the world. So I think back to my daughter who's about to start high school because I have to come to terms with and you have to come to terms with the fact that you and your children not only may but will suffer painful losses if we remain true to all that Jesus is for us in the gospel and all that he reveals to us in his word. That's where we are. We're in that age. Students, kids, high school students, listen to me. You need to be prepared as a follower of Christ to lose friends, to lose reputation, to have your character maligned for the sake of who Jesus is, for the sake of all that is good and that is right and that is true. That was not the case for me when I was in high school. But it is the case now, going forward. And so my daughter and I, we talk a lot about these things. We talk about her good friend who's changed her sexual identity two or three times over the past year, um, who had a boyfriend last year and has a girlfriend now. Uh, we talk about things of, of race on the basis of Scripture, not on the basis of just some how we were raised type of thing, but on the basis of Scripture. We dig into these things. And we talk about what it means to love our black and brown neighbors. We, we tell her that if she's, if she's going to stand firm, that she, she will be, have, to, to be, have to be prepared to suffer some of these losses some of these malignings of her character. And that's hard. That's hard. Listen, that's hard for us as grown men who ought to be mature enough and firm enough in our faith to, to, to possibly endure that kind of thing. But get into the heart of a 14-year-old girl. Because what difference does the gospel make if it costs you friendships, right? What, what, what difference does the gospel make if, if people say mean things about you? What difference does the love of Jesus make to you if it, if it costs you so dearly? That's the, that's the question that all of us have to face, but it's a question that definitely she has to face, our children have to face, our grandchildren have to face, you have to face. What difference does it make? Um, how do we as men and fathers, as followers of Christ, live in an age we're living with faith and faithfulness to Jesus is not only seen as hopelessly naive, a belief in a fairy tale, but, but actually is something that's profoundly oppressive. How do we raise our children? How do we lead our families? How do we live in individuals 
as individuals in a time like this. Um, we've all heard that we need to be woke, right? That's kind of the slogan of the age. I would say, yes, we need to be woke. We need to be woke. We need to be woke on the grounds of Scripture. We need to be awakened to what the Scripture says. Being woke is something that's biblical. Paul talks about this in several places. The hour has come for you to wake from your sleep. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. In other words, it's a totally different definition than what the world has, but in other words, we, we need to wake up to who God is, be revived by Him, rest in Him, trust in Him, open our eyes to behold who He is and what He's like, and let our whole hearts be galvanized by all that He reveals Himself to be in the Word. I want to read a passage to you from John 15. I'm not going to start preaching a 30-minute sermon now. I've already gone a while. Don't, don't worry. You're going to get to get out of here before dinner. But I do want to read this passage to you. And it's kind of the, about, a, about like a tour of Europe from outer space. It's, it's from John 15, verses 1 through 11. And so I'm just going to say a few words before we go about it. But I want to read this passage to you. Jesus says this. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches." Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. I want to just give you two practical hooks as we go into this world in light of this passage. The first is this, is that you need to know who you are. You need to know your identity. You need to know who you are. And who are you according to this passage? You're a branch. You're a branch. You're a branch connected to the vine, who is Jesus. You're a branch, and, and if you've seen a vineyard, you've seen the branches on a, on a vineyard with grapes, they're fragile. Bran branches, are, branches are fragile. I mean, you can, you can break the branch off of, a, off of a grapevine quite easily. And that ought to tell you that there's a, there's a weakness that you and I all have, and that ought to humble us. That, that, ought, to, that ought to humble us. That, that ought to reveal to us that oftentimes our, our minds and our hearts are, are dim, and we are by nature oriented away from who God is and what He's like and what He reveals to us in His Word. And that affects absolutely every aspect of our lives. On the one hand, we're, we're prone to seeking acceptance from the world by accommodating ourselves to the world, by capitulating to, to the ideas and the frameworks and the paradigms that the world is thrusting at us. And let me tell you this, men, 
You are being discipled seven days a week by something all the time. You're being discipled by it. You're being discipled by the news that you watch. You're being discipled by the shows that you watch. You're being discipled by what you listen to, by the people you're around, by the things that you read, by all of that. You're always being discipled in some direction. And because of that, and because of the weakness that we have in our own hearts, that again is oriented away from God by nature, it is going to be very, that's the gravitational pull that's, that's pulling us. It's, it's, it's pulling us in that direction. And we need to see that on the one hand, it's very easy for us to capitulate to the spirit of the age, but on the other hand, there, there are ways in which w- the complaints that the culture has against us in some respects are true. M- maybe the attitudes of your heart towards those who don't look like you or me have not always been in line with the gospel. I mean, you have to, you have to think that if we're people who, who are prone to maximize our virtues and minimize our vices and look at other people and minimize their virtues and maximize their vices, why wouldn't it be on the basis of race or some other thing? I mean, whether that is two grains of sand on the whole seashore of what's going on in your heart or a substantial amount, perhaps it's there. And those are real things. And we do well to consider that well, all the complaints about all the isms, the, the this-ism and the that-ism and the that-ism and the this-ism that, that people c- complain about, it, th- there's, there's very likely at least some degree to which there may be an element of truth in that. And if that's the case, then what we need to do is we need to go right back to Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us and forgives those things. That's the difference. See, in the gospel, you get forgiveness. You get grace. You don't get that in the critical theory junk or the anti-racism junk or all the other junk out there. You don't get that there, but you get it in Jesus. You get the forgiveness. You get the grace. You get the power of the Holy Spirit to change, to be renewed. So in our weakness, let's own that. Let's not push it away. Let's say that's who I am and go right back to the one who loved us and gave himself for us, our faithful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we need to go with this. And that's why you can own it. And that's why you can repent. Right? We're weak. But then the other thing about branches is that branches are to be fruitful. Right? Branches, they exist to produce and bear the weight of the fruit. That's that's why they're there. And, And being fruitful... Tell you this when I was, I took a class you'd probably all be in seminary, it's, it's a, fa- a class you'd probably all be super fascinated by church polity, right? Presbyterian church government. I mean, that's something that people are lining up at the door to take, right? And so, I take this class, and it's by the, the guy who, who taught it was the very first moderator of the Presbyterian Church in America, Jack Wilkinson. And, and uh, he's, he's passed away now, but he, um, he gave us all this coin. And on one side of the coin, it was inscribed tough-minded, and the other side, it was inscribed tender-hearted. And he said that as a, as, a, as a pastor, that's the fruit that we need to be bearing and what we need to be leaning into as men who are about to go out and preach the gospel. And I would say that extends beyond who's ever standing beyond the pulpit. I mean, that, Look at the qualifications for, for an elder in, in 2 Timothy, right? I mean, th- those, are, those are characteristics that really, besides being able to teach, all Christian men ought to have those things. I mean, they're, they're, they're character traits, right? And, and so what we need is, 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 in a nutshell, to have a tough mind, which means that we know the Scriptures... And, and we're galvanized by what's in the Scriptures, and our, our heart trusts in what, that God's Word is good and right and true, and we know it, and we're able to teach it to our children, as we see in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, teach it to your children, 
so that they will be equipped and they will know not on the basis of, of just common sense or, or, or how you were raised, but on the basis of the foundation of God's unchanging word as to why they ought to live in a certain way and why they ought to believe what they ought to believe. Because it's for, as we see at the end of this passage, for the fullness of our joy, for our flourishing, for our well-being, for the glory of, of God. We need to be tough-minded, which means we need to know this word and we need to stand firm in it. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. That's being tough-minded, and, and, and tough-minded men are people who, who, who deeply trust that God's Word is good and right and true, and their life is shaped by it, it's framed by it. But also, we need to have a tender heart. We need to have a tender heart. We need to speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth in love, with compassion, with grace, with understanding. We need to listen. We need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. We need to engage our children in such a way. We need to engage our neighbors in such a way. We need to engage our wives in, in such a way. We don't need to come off sounding like bombastic jerks who are just regurgitating what we hear from Tucker Carlson or or Don Lemon, or whoever else. That's, that's not who ought to be ultimately shaping our life. We speak the truth as revealed in Scripture with humble confidence, humility knowing who we are in our own native state, and with the confidence who Jesus is and that his word is true. Third, knowing who we are means that we know that we sometimes need to get pruned in order to grow. And the pruning that we receive comes by the Holy Spirit into our lives as we lay ourselves before the means of grace. You know, there's something, you've heard about church discipline, and that sounds super scary because it sounds like someone's going to get a letter and they're going to get kicked out of the church and they're not going to be able to take communion. Here's the deal, when you come and sit under the Word of God on Sunday morning, after Sunday morning, and you read the Word on your own, there's discipline going on. That's discipline right there. The Lord is shaving off those rough edges around your, your soul as you, as you lift your, your heart in, in song and, and praise to Him as you sing, as you, as you confess your sins here, as, as you're renewed by grace, as you, as you lift up your petitions before the Lord in prayer according to His will, as, as you're sent out with His his word of promise, there's discipline going on, there's shaping of your life. And, and here's the deal, it, it, fathers and husbands, listen to this, if, 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 if the gathered worship of God and, and the connection to the local church is simply one of 20 priorities in your life, if it's an optional add-on, rather than being what your life is oriented around, then you are going to be pulled off in this direction away from Christ. And your, your children certainly will. I mean, if, 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 you, if you are part of the church, if you, if you make worship a, a once-a-month priority or a once-every-other-week priority, and then your children grow up and they get out of the house, why would they make it any more of a priority than you've made it? It's, it's important to, to, to be here and not let sports and trips and sleeping in and work to do and the lawn and the cat or the whatever take such precedence over your life that you're shoving the gathered worship of God to the margins and you're not making use of the means of grace regularly. This isn't some legalistic burden I'm trying to lay on you. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to point you to where, where you find the grace, where you, we call it means of grace. It's grace. It's mercy. It's help. It's power in the Holy Spirit. 
And that's where we get pruned. Knowing who you are as a branch that's weak, that is called to be fruitful, and that needs to be pruned in order to be fruitful, that's, how, that's one of the ways, one of the fundamental ways in which we navigate our way through this age. And, and finally, the last thing I want to say this. We need to not only know who we are, we need to know whose we are. We need to know whose we are, and we are people who belong to the vine. We are people who belong to Christ. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. We have been bought at the price of Jesus' own life, at the cost of his life. We are people who are loved deeply to the point where Jesus took on the unmitigated wrath of the Father, not for his sins, but for your sins. And he took them as his own. The sins that you have in your life that nobody knows about, the dark parts of your heart and your mind that nobody knows about, and if people did, you would flock out of here in embarrassment. He knows that. He's taken it. He's paid it. He's conquered it. He has risen, and he's done it because he first was seeking to glorify the Father who he loves and who loves him, and he loves his people. He loves you. He wanted to redeem you. He's declared you as his son and adopted you and given you all the hope of glory and all that is yours in Jesus Christ. And so now when we read in Scripture that Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me, We know that we are following the one who took up his cross in order to redeem us, who loves us. He's not just leading us into into a a life of peril with, with with no hope at the end of it. He's calling us to to go into this world that's antagonistic to you, that's antagonistic to Christ, that's antagonistic to the things of Christ and to take up your cross daily and fight the good fight and finish the race and doing so in the power of the Spirit, never, ever, ever, ever forgetting that you have a God who's given you a love that will never let you go, who's cast your sins off as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more, who says there is now no condemnation for for you in Christ Jesus, who says that nothing... And all creation can separate you from his love. That's who you are. That's your identity. You want to know what your identity is? That's it. That's who you are. That's so much more profound and so much more beautiful and so much more true than all the other things that may identify identify you in this life or may identify somebody else. That's ultimately who you are. You have been reconciled to Christ. The love of faith and faithfulness of Jesus Christ to you in the gospel. So much greater than the sufferings that you'll endure on this side of the cross. So let's endeavor as Christian men and boys, whatever our station in life, to think and pray this into our souls. Pray it into your souls. Pray the truth of who Jesus is to your soul. Don't don't stop praying until it gets there. And it sticks like nailing jello to the wall. Pray it in there. Beg him to change your heart. Beg him to give you affections for him. And fight to abide in his love by all the means that he gives to us, his word, his gospel, his people, his worship, for the glory of God, for our own good, for the good of our families, for the good of those who have yet to come to know him. 
Amen. Let's pray.